Our vision at DBF Central is to cultivate Christ-centered communities, to cultivate Christ-centered communities. Why? To redeem Delhi and beyond for the glory of God. And the large part of that cultivating Christ-centeredness in this community is done through the preaching and teaching of God's word. That's core to us. Preaching and teaching of God's word is, is one of our core values. And so what we do here at DBF Central, if you're new to DBF Central, is that we pick up the books of the Bible and we go through it verse by verse, passage by passage, seeing what God has to say through his word, because when the word of God speaks, God speaks. And keeping that in mind, last week we started a new series called Walking in Shadow in the book of 1 John, first letter of John or first epistle of John. And we did that to ascertain whether we are walking close to Jesus and therefore in his shadow or we are walking in shadows, that is darkness. Therefore, the title, Walking in Shadow. Last week, we saw the background for this book, that John is reasserting the true gospel against the claims of the newly emerged teaching and philosophy called Gnosticism, which denies Jesus' claims to be the God incarnate, God in flesh, and therefore denies his claim to be the author of salvation to simply put. This morning, our passage is 1 John 1, verse 5 to chapter 2, verse 2. Last week, we looked at the first four verses of 1 John chapter 1, and we looked at two characteristics of this word of life, namely Jesus. We looked at his eternality, and we looked at his humanity, and what does that mean for us? And this morning, we're going to look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 to chapter 2, verse 2. Four preachers, four preachers, friends, they met for a casual gathering, met for a friendly gathering, and during the conversation, one preacher said that, you know, a lot of our people, they come to us, they pour their hearts out, they confess, and they, they lay open their lives, and it's, and it's good, it's comforting for the soul. We must do that as well. As preachers and teachers of God's word, as pastors, we must do that as well. And slowly what started happening was all four of them agreed, and all four of them started confessing their sins to one another. The first preacher confessed, he said, I love movies, so what I do when nobody's watching, nobody's around, then I just sneak out during the office hours and I go watch a movie. And people are beginning to get scandalized a bit, but that's okay, they're confessing, it's a, it's a, a safe, and safe environment to confess. And the second preacher goes, he said, I don't drink, I don't smoke, but I love smoking cigars. You know, they're, they're good, big. I love smoking cigars, but I don't do it in public, I do it in secret, in my private space. The third one says, you know, well, I'm not, I'm not a chronic gambler, but I do like to gamble every now and then. You know, a little bit here and there, a little amount of money, not much. And then the fourth person, his chance comes up. And he's, he's, he has to confess because all three have confessed. And he's not confessing. And the four of the, three of them are pressing him. Why aren't you confessing? What is the secret? What is the vice in your life that you want to get out of? Confess it right now. And the fourth preacher, pastor, he says, my problem is gossiping, and I can't wait to get out of here. <laughs> See, John talks about three things in this passage. He talks about a truth about God, verse 5. He talks about our attitude towards sin, verses 6 to 10. And then he talks about a defense against sin our defense against sin, chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Three things, the truth about God, our attitude towards sin, and our defense against sin. Let me read God's word. Chapter 1, verse 5, all the way to chapter 2, verse 2. If you have your Bibles, please follow along. This is the word of God. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. 
He's the propitiation for our sins, and not ours, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. You see, John begins this passage in verse 5. This verse 5 is the principal statement for this passage. The whole passage rests on this first statement, the first truth that John reveals about God. And God and John begins like this. He says, this is a message we have heard from Jesus and proclaimed to you. This is a message that Jesus has passed on to us. And the same message we proclaim to you, we preach to you. And then he gives you the content of that message. He says that message is, God is light. And in him, there is no darkness. God is light and in him, there is no darkness at all. It's a double negative. But what does that mean? See, John is simple yet profound. He makes statements like this, God is light. What does that mean? Have you ever thought about it? What does it mean for God to be light? And that there is no darkness in him at all. See, it means two things. First is God is life. God is light means God is life. John says in John 1.4, he says, in him was light. John is the author of the fourth gospel. In chapter 1, verse 4, he says, In him was light, talking about Jesus. So first of all, this light is personal. Jesus is God's light personified. Jesus says in John chapter 8, I am the light of the world. And John then goes on and says that that life was light of men. That life, this life, Jesus was the light of men. That Jesus was this life-giving light. So in essence, you can say that God is the source of all life. When you say God is light, God is the source of all life. He has life in him. He is life. You see, life is not a part of God that he gives to you. Life is not something that radiates or emanates out of God. Life is not something, uh, rules or regulations or process or a way or a mantra that God gives to us. Life is when this God eternal steps into our temporal life and embraces us that we receive this true life. If God is source of all life, that means there is no death in him. Death doesn't restrict him. Death doesn't bind him. Death doesn't end him. This true, self-sustained, eternally existing life has no end. And it is when this, this self-existing, eternal life steps into our temporal life and embraces us. It takes our temporal life and transforms it into an eternal life. Life. He takes our mortality and transforms it into immortality, first of the soul and then of the body. God is light means God is life. God is light means God is truth. You see, God is light and in him there is no darkness. It means that there is no hidden agenda in God. There is no fine print with God. God is not something black that you order online and receive navy blue. That's not how God is like. There is no lie in him. There is no deceit in him. He's unsullied even by the shadow of sin. He's pure. He is holy. And if God is the truth, if God is a source of all truth, if he is the measure of all truth, that the truth about your life and my life, the truth about your existence and my existence, the truth about your purpose, your calling, my purpose and my calling is not found in Google. It's not found in the Facebook. It's not found in the books and philosophies of this age or the age gone by or any age for that matter. It's definitely not in you. The truth about you is not in you. I'm not talking about the Holy Spirit in you. I'm, I'm talking about the pre-salvation time. It's, it's alien to you. It's external to you. It's definitely not in this culture and its promises. If you want to know the truth about your existence, about your identity, about your purpose and your calling, go to the truth. God. 
Stop looking around. But what does it mean for God to be light? It means for God to be life. That eternal life, self-existing eternal life that gives life to us. Eternal. What does it mean for God to be light? It means God to be truth. Who is the truth of our existence? Who is the truth of all truths? He's the beginning of truth. John moves on, verse 6. He says, if we say we have fellowship with him, if we say, if we confess that we have fellowship with him, stop right there. What does it mean to be in fellowship with this God who's light? What does the word fellowship mean? In this context, the word fellowship means intimate relationship, personal relationship. So the question you and I got to ask is what does it mean to have an intimate personal relationship with this God who's light, the God who's life, the God who's truth? It means to live all your life in light. It means to eat, breathe, sleep, wake up, walk in light. It means not to give even an inch of darkness space in your life. Not an iota of darkness in your life because even if you dip your pinky finger in darkness, you will lose fellowship with God because God is all light and in him there is no darkness and he is pure and therefore he cannot do with darkness. So even if the nail of your finger is in darkness, he cannot have fellowship with you. Therefore, there is no space for pride or self-centeredness, self-preservation, self-gratification, self-worship or people worship. Because the moment you step into darkness, you lose fellowship with God. You can't have fellowship with God. John says in John chapter 12, verse 36, he says, Believe in the light that you may become sons of light, daughters of light to be gender specific. You see, if you claim to be the sons of light or daughters of light, if you claim to be enlightened by this light of God in your salvation experience and you harbor darkness in your life, you harbor sin in your life, then John says you are liars. And the truth of God is not in you. The truth of God. If we confess that we have this fellowship, this intimate relationship, this, this uh, communion with God, and on the other hand, we are walking in sin, we are walking in darkness, and John says, you are liars. Your confession is a lie. And the truth of God is not in you. You don't practice that truth. You see, John is not talking about sinless perfection here, that once you come in God's light, you stop sinning. No, he's not talking about that. John is not a perfectionist in that regard. He knows it's not possible. He knows it's not possible. He knows that till the time we are in this flesh, there is sin and there will be sin. While, there is, while the spirit is being renewed, the flesh is decaying and is being wasted. Till the time the Lord returns and renews our bodies as well. We are going to sin. He says that in verse 8. In fact, he says that if we confess that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. We fool ourselves if we say we have no sin. So what does John mean to be in light as God is in light? He's saying that means that you cannot harbor sin in your life without confessing it. He means if you're walking in darkness... And you confess that God is light, that that means there is sin in your life that you have harbored and you have not confessed it. You are sitting on the pile of unconfessed sin in your life. You see, true, true mark of fellowship with God is constant confession leading to constant confirmation. True mark of fellowship with God is constant confession leading to constant conformation. Not confer, not F-I-R, F-O-R. Confirmation. Constant confession of your sin leading you to constant confirmation. To what? Confirming you to what? To the image of this world? No, to the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
It's God's will for your lives. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the watershed moment if you're looking for God's will in your life. God's will for your life is for you to become like Jesus. Romans 8, 29. That's it. That's God's will for your life, to become like Jesus. There's no mystical will of God. This is it. God has revealed it. And Paul says that God uses everything in your life, every turn, every roadblock, every dead end, every pain, sorrow, grief, every accident in your life to shape you into the image of his son. And if you, if you are in that confirmation process and there is sin in your life which is not confessed, then it delays or stops that confirmation process. It delays or stops that confirmation process. And if that confirmation process is stopped, if God's sanctifying work in your life stops, if you're not being conformed to the image of God's Son, then you're not in a state of limbo. You cannot be morally neutral. You cannot say that I'm not being conformed into the image of God's Son, but I'm not being conformed into any other image. It's not possible. You're either being confirmed upward or you're confirmed downward. You're either being conformed into the image of Jesus or you're being conformed into the image of this world. So if the sin in your life that is blocking or as a roadblock working to delay or halt your confirmation process into the image of God's Son, that means you're being conformed to someone else's image. You see, when God's light shines upon you and he brings you in his light, he looks at your life and he sees his marred image. He sees his disfigured image. And he picks that image of himself in you and he starts putting it together, crack by crack, piece by piece. He starts the re-piecing process to see the ultimate image, the final image of his son in you. But when there is unconfessed sin in your life, those cracks that God filled, those pieces that God put back together, those cracks begin to open again. Those pieces begin to fall again. And there is delay in the process. The question is, why don't we confess our sins? Why don't we deal with our sins? Why are we wary of it? Four reasons, I want to quickly look at them. First is that you're ignorant about it. You don't know that you have sin in your life. Perhaps the world knows, at least God knows, but you don't know, you're, you're ignorant about it. You see, the fact that you say you're ignorant about your sin says that you're not walking in God's light. Because your proximity to Jesus will reveal any sin in your life. If you're walking close to Jesus, if you're walking in Jesus' shadow, so close to him, that sin will be revealed in your life. But the fact that you're ignorant of your sin, ignorant of, of the presence of sin in your life, that tells me that you're not walking close to God. And therefore you're ignorant about it. John says... When we walk in the light as he's in the light, the blood of Jesus cleanses us of all sin. So if you're walking in light, if you're walking in the shadow of Jesus, you will see your sin. And the absence of that sight and awareness of your sin tells me that you're not walking close to Jesus. The second reason why we don't confess sin is because you're, you think your sin is greater. The mountain, the pile of sin and guilt and shame that you're sitting on is higher and greater than what God can forgive. You believe that. And this pile of sin that you have been sitting on, the guilt that is producing guilt in you and telling you that God cannot forgive it, is not amassed overnight. It's not the result of one act of sin in your life. It's been a pattern over a certain period. One sin, then the other, then the other, then the other, and it kept piling up. And now you're sitting on this Mount Everest of sin and you think, no, God cannot reach here. 
Or the other reason why we think God cannot forgive my sin is because you have repeated the same sin hundred times and you have confessed it hundred times. You go back to God and confess this one sin every day. God forgive me, God forgive me, God forgive me, God forgive me. And you come to hundred time and you say, can he forgive me hundred and first time? And you say, no, he can't be that gracious. He can't be that forgiving. Hundred times, yeah, probably. Hundred and first time? Probably not. So let me not go there. And so I don't confess my sin. Or rather, I believe that God cannot forgive it. Third reason why I why you don't confess his sin is because you think you have not sinned. First is that you're ignorant. Second is, you think that God cannot forgive it. It's too much. Third is, you think you have not sinned. You see, I talked about it briefly last week. The culture we live in is, is constantly becoming more accommodating, more people-sensitive. Certain things that were permissible 10 years ago are a taboo. Certain things that were not permissible 10 years ago are permissible today. No matter how promiscuous, how preposterous those things are, we have euphemism for everything. We can't use harsh words anymore. We have to be very people sensitive. And in a culture like that, or a culture that is becoming like that, the big S word is a taboo as well. The word sin is not to be used. The word sin is to be reserved only for heinous crimes, if at all, like rapes and murders, etc. Small things like manipulating a report at office, or calling in sick on Monday when you're not actually sick. Arrogance, self-centeredness, drunkenness, pornography, premarital sex, extramarital affairs, abusive language, road rage, neglecting familial responsibilities, giving God a second-hand treatment. Those are all preferences. Preferences. We, we live in, a, in an age of relativism. Everything is relative. Or they are perceived realities. We have another words for sin. Error, mistake, oops. Blind spot. The problem is our definition of sin. It's our definition of sin. We think sin is anything that harms others or myself with an immediate effect. Sin is anything that harms others and myself with a visible, immediate effect. Something to do with destruction, loss. And the flip side is, if there is no immediate, visible impact of my action onto my life or someone else's life, then that is not sin. So small things like lying, cheating, no sin, no visible impact. The problem is our definition is wrong. And if we have established that God is the truth, let's go back to God and understand what is his definition of sin. You see, God's definition of sin is violation of his image. Period. Anything, anything that brings, oh, <coughs> brings the standard of God down. You see, when God created man, when God finished his creation, he looked at it, the pinnacle of it being man, he looked at his creation after creating man, and he said it's very good. And when he said it's very good, he placed a standard, he placed a worth on that creation. And so every time we commit an act that brings that standard of that very good thing down, that's a sin. Anything that, any act that violates that perfect holy image of God in us is a sin. Every violation of God's image and his shalom is a sin. And every sin that we commit is against him. Every offense that we commit is against him first, before it is against anyone else. It is against him first, because you're created in his image. David realized this, and therefore in Psalm 51, after committing that sin against Bathsheba, he says, only against you and you only have I sinned. 
He sinned against Bathsheba. He could have said, I've sinned against Bathsheba. No, he says, I've sinned against you and you only. Why? David knew that he had marred the image of God. He has further disfigured and marred the image of God. He has destroyed the image of God. He has violated the image of God by committing that heinous crime. Although against Bathsheba, but against God first. See, there's no small sin and big sin. Sin is sin. Sin is against God, and therefore it must be confessed. So I don't confess because I'm ignorant. I don't confess because I believe God cannot forgive. I am ignorant. I, I don't confess because I don't believe I have sinned. And fourth, I don't confess because I don't want to confess. I enjoy my sin. You know, God, sin. I'm, I'm reveling in my sin. I'm just enjoying my sin. The sin has so captivated me and consumed me that I don't want to confess it. I don't want to confess it. It's pleasurable. It gives me joy. You see, the more you run away from confession of your sin, the more you run, a, run towards sin. The more you run away from confessing your sin, the more you run towards sin. These reasons are in ascending order. By the time you reach the fourth stage where you don't want to confess your sin, you are dead cold before God. The light in you is snuffed out, if at all there was a light in the first place. Good question to ask. The true mark of fellowship with God is confession leading to confirmation, constant confession leading to confirmation, repentance leading to renewal. No confession, no confirmation, no fellowship. True mark of fellowship with God is constant confession leading to constant confirmation. John moves on. And just like last week's passage, he gives us the purpose of his writing. He says, I tell you why I'm writing these things. There's a purpose behind it. This, these are not random, aimless writings on, or scribbling. There's a purpose behind it. He says, the purpose behind writing these things to you that I have written to you is so that you may not sin. But I know you will sin. He says, I know you will sin. And when you sin, you have a defense against that sin. He says, when you sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Christ Jesus, the righteous. He says, he's not just an advocate. He is the propitiation for our sins. And he says, atoning sacrifice for our sin. He says, Jesus who is resurrected, who ascended, is seated at the right hand of the Father. He's your advocate. He's your advocate. Every time you and I commit a sin, he stands up, he shows his, the marks on his body, the nail-pierced hands, the nail-pierced legs, and the spear-thrusted side and says, paid for. And the Father says, yep. Paid for. He's not just an advocate. John says he's a propitiation. The word propitiation means sin offering. You see, your sin and my sin, if it is an offense against God, if it is an act against God, therefore it attracts God's justice. Therefore it attracts God's wrath. Paul says in Ephesians 2, he says, we were by nature objects of God's wrath. Children waiting to attract God's wrath. But God poured his wrath over Christ, his son. When he nailed him to the cross, Jesus became sin offering in our stead. We were supposed to be there. But God poured his justice, his righteousness, his wrath on Jesus. God 
turned his face away, broke, if you were, that fellowship with Jesus so that his fellowship with you and me can be or could be established. You see, the marks on Jesus' body, the nail-pierced hand and the legs and the spear thrust inside, they serve as an eternal reminder of the greatness of our sin. They serve as an eternal reminder. God, although Jesus, although seated on the Father's right hand, he still bears those marks. Those marks on his body bear witness to the greatness of our sin, to the seriousness of our sin. Don't take it lightly. But the good news is that the marks he bears on his body are not there to load you with guilt and shame. It's not there to just, just make you, make sin and guilt, make guilt and shame heavy upon you. That look, this is what you did. No. No. Those, while it does show the greatness of our sin, the seriousness of our sin, it also shows you the extent of God's love. The marks that Jesus carries on his body, the nail-pierced hand, the nail-pierced legs, and the spirit, spear-thrusted side, they show you the extravagance, the luxury, of God's eternal love. How prodigious is his love. How amazing is his love. That while we were still reveling in our sin, while we were still harboring sin, while we were still enjoying our sin, gloating in it, Christ died for us. So that God's light can be in us as we confess him to be the Lord and Savior. Paul says in Romans 8, nothing, nothing under the sun can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Nothing can. No amount of sin, no amount of guilt. Do you think God cannot forgive you? Look at Christ. No matter how high the mountain of your guilt is, no matter how deep the ocean of your sin is, God is able to forgive. In fact, he has done it already. He has done it already. John says, not just for Christians, but for the whole world. He is savior to this world. Let this abundant, extraordinary, extravagant grace of God shown in the sacrifice of his son lead you to confession and a life in light. Do it because he has gone ahead and done it for you. The question is not whether God can forgive. The question is, have we understood grace? Have we really understood grace? Or we are still trying to do something to earn God's favor? <laughs>